The Seven Music Rooms Startup Shenanigans in Old Milwaukee This startup business story is set in the mid-1960s. It was a time before personal computers, before the Internet, before cable TV, before digital cameras or video, before cell phones, before the first moon landing. Cars had chrome fins but no seat belts or exhaust regulations, and the only sound playing inside them was AM radio. LPs and 45 RPM singles ruled the day, and tube amplifiers generated the newly invented stereo sound. Reel-to-reel -reel analog tape recorders were just being replaced by tape cassettes. CDs were 20 years in the future. Kids carried small transistor radios, and many scientists and engineers still used slide rules. Polaroid land cameras were the latest thing in film photography. One 1965 dollar bought eight times as much as now in 2020. For example, a pack of doctor-recommended cigarettes or a gallon of fully leaded gasoline cost 25 cents, and a brand new Ford Falcon or VW Beetle could be bought for $1,700. A typical union worker made $10,000 a year and could buy a nice house for $25,000. Chapter 1. The Wooden Booths of Mrs. Max A serious accounting major, who usually didn't sit around nibbling greasy fries and smoking French cigarettes instead of going to classes, burst into Mrs. Max's tiny coffee shop, leaving the door standing wide open to the late November wind, an omission which immediately evoked a chorus of bellows from the students sitting in the wooden booths inside. "'They shot him,' the boy announced." JFK is dead in Dallas. The bastard shot him. It's on the radio just now. It's for real. This got David Isambard Gantz to look up from the circuit diagram he was intently drawing on a napkin. With his white blonde hair and blue eyes, David didn't look old enough to be a TA in the UWM physics department, but they thought he was another Tesla, so they had hired him even though he was only an undergrad and still looked like a high school student. David spent his mornings drinking coffee in Mrs. Max with elite students whose favorite sport was to see if they could get an A in a course without ever attending lectures. Like the other elites, Dave would spend the rest of the day in the old student union across the street in a little closed room with a giant clip speaker in one corner, which could play classical records if you requested them. A small plaque on the door read, The Music Room and everyone who spent time there thought they were either sophisticated or brilliant or both. But what they really had in common was the music, just as the sign on the door said. Since there was a cafeteria in the student union across the street, there was no nutritional reason for the quaint little coffee shop, which everyone called Mrs. Max, to continue to exist at all. Yet it did, and its six scarred wooden booths were filled to capacity with smoking students most of the time. David Gantz had been huddled conspiratorially in the booth next to Ralph Iverson, a socialist with some practical electrical skills, and Paul Anderson, a philosophy major who had, at age 19, sailed to Paris in the cheapest cabin of the Queen Mary, just to obtain copies of Henry Miller's more obscene banned books and act them out, if possible, in place. Alas, Paris had changed since Miller was there in the twenties, and Paul's ambitious hedonic mission had been completely thwarted by the theft of most of his luggage at Gar Saint Lazar, by a porter who said he was taking it to a nice clean hotel nearby. Janie Mueller, the ink-stained girl with listless dull hair and dark green knee-high wool stockings, cuddling hopefully next to Paul, had just told Ralph a little too loudly and apropos of nothing, that he should not insult the man she loved, meaning Paul, which had made everyone else in the booth uncomfortable, because Ralph had not insulted anyone, and people did not go around just blurting out things like that. Janie, who looked normal enough with clothes on, had, when viewed naked, one breast noticeably smaller than the other. She also had had an unfortunate yeast infection, when she and Paul had first unexpectedly ended up naked in his fold-away twin bed, after becoming uncontrollably aroused by listening to a recording of La Boheme. 
The white vaginal powder had combined with her lopsided breast to spoil what she was sure might have been the start of a great love affair. Paul had published several short stories in The Practical Cat, the campus literary magazine Janie edited, and she remained determined that he was too good a prospect in the cultural wasteland of Milwaukee to lose just because of something that could be corrected with a rolled-up sock. She had been energetically pressing her wool stocking against his jeans under the table and was about to add some hidden handwork when she was interrupted by JFK's terrible news. Someone in the kitchen, it could have been Mrs. McMahon herself, let out a loud groan. John Fitzgerald Kennedy had everything a hard-working fifty-ish Irish widow could love. Catholic, good Irish looks, and a chic wife who spoke French to Charles de Gaulle. To the college boys he was a hero because of Marilyn Monroe, but JFK was a real war hero, and besides, that awful Monroe woman had committed suicide last summer. And now some communist had shot JFK in Texas. "'Who would want to kill JFK?' Janie asked earnestly. "'He's the best president we ever had.' "'I would have voted for him if I had been old enough,' Ralph Iverson added, even though, like Milwaukee's three socialist mayors, Ralph was a proud member of the American Socialist Party and not a Democrat. Mrs. Mack removed her floral wraparound apron and clicked on the Zenith AM table radio on the checkout counter. The static wine filled the hush room as its tubes warmed up. The announcer on WTMJ was just telling us that Paul Mall cigarettes were outstanding and they were mild. Paul Anderson's six-foot-four-inch older brother, Derek, a recent UWM business graduate and already a working real estate salesman, had been lucky to find a parking space for his TR4 almost in front of the diner. He slammed the shop door behind him as he entered. "'Why was this door left open?' he asked, looking around the room. "'What's going on?' "'Kennedy's been shot,' his younger brother quickly replied. "'In Dallas.' Paul Anderson, who had been reading science fiction since he was nine, had started liking and believing in Kennedy when he had said we were going to the moon. His brother Derek, though he disagreed with his father on just about everything else, had supported Nixon rather than Kennedy. "'Guess he'll get to the moon before we do,' he cracked. When no one laughed, he changed the subject. "'Anyone know who is vice president?' There was no immediate answer, so bright had John Kennedy's light been. Finally, Dave's sometime girlfriend, who everyone said looked like Popeye's girlfriend, Olive Oil, floated softly from a distant booth. Johnson, London, I think, Christine Rival said. Why would an American name their son after a British city? The radio announcer, sounding shaken and uncertain, started to say something about Kennedy when he was cut off and suddenly replaced by Madhavani's singing strings. Is there a television set in the student union? Janie asked in frustration. You don't have one, Ralph complained while screwing up his face. They say it would be too distracting for studying, but I think they just can't afford it. Piss poor funding for Milwaukee. Half my classes aren't Quonset huts or rented rooms. There is a TV in the Dewdrop Inn, Jim Bottle offered in his basso profundo voice and immediately regretted. Most of the students in Mrs. Max, including Bottle, were not twenty-one, and the Dewdrop Inn checked IDs if you looked underage, which was never a problem for Bottle, who had looked and sounded at least thirty since he was twelve. "'The young hero is sacrificed,' Paul intoned solemnly, having just read Sir James Fraser's Golden Bow. "'But it should have been in the springtime, I think,' he added." "'You people are too idealistic,' Derek said loudly to the room. "'Kennedy was a spoiled trust fund baby, and his old man was a bootlegger. Good riddance, I say.' "'I believed in him,' Janey said wistfully. "'Now what are we going to do?' Derek was here to talk business. "'How's your amplifier coming, Dave?' the tall boy said, as if to answer, elbowing Janey even tighter against Paul as he slid into the booth. The frequency response will be almost flat, twenty to twenty. Better than anything on the market, I think, Dave said, matter-of-factly. It's full stereo, all in one circuit. 
and the 12 AX7 tubes give it at least 12 RMS watts per channel. Derek and his brother Paul were skilled part-time musicians, played a dozen wind and keyboard instruments in their own dance band, and several semi-pro or school orchestras. They had grown up basking in the all-enveloping sound of classical music, as heard while playing inside an orchestra, and were keen on any sound system that approached that full surround sound sensory experience. They had built a Heathkit stereo and FM receiver when they were in high school and knew how hard that was to do. When will you finish the prototype? Derek asked. I lifted the tubes from the school lab, but I don't have the power transformers. Ralph thinks we could cannibalize old TV sets for the resistors and capacitors and maybe even power supplies. Ralph Iverson, who might have been thought roughly handsome if he did not distort his acne-scarred face when he talked, repaired radios and televisions in his parents' garage and had accidentally discovered that appliance stores that took trade-ins would give them to anyone who would haul them away. Being self-taught, Ralph did not have Dave's theoretical grasp of electronics, but he did understand practical appliance repair and had learned that he could often get used electronics working again. Dirt! It's almost always greasy dirt, he had often said. Once in a while it's a cold solder joint or a burnt resistor, but most of the time all you have to do is clean the circuit board with Radio Shack solvent. We need a place, a factory, to build it, Derek said, meaning the new Isambard amplifier, as he had already named it in his mind. I think I found one. It's a little standalone building on Farwell. It's been condemned because it's where the off-ramp of the freeway is going near North Avenue. The city bought it eminent domain last year, but freeway funding got delayed, and the ramp isn't going in for six months at least. My dad's friend in the freeway office says we could rent it for a hundred dollars a month until it's torn down if we wanted a place to start building your amplifier. A whole building? David mused wonderingly. What's in it now? It's a small building, just an old used bookstore in front, large workroom and back, there is a basement and an apartment upstairs. We might be able to do something with the bookstore area, like a factory sales room for the stereos. Or a coffee house, Paul suggested. We could make a coffee house out of it, like the unicorn. The unicorn, which Paul frequented, served up the required cappuccino and the usual folk singers, flamenco guitars, and beret-wearing beatniks shouting obscene prose poems on Thursday nights. It was also the only place on the east side where anyone willing to risk a felony conviction could score a skinny reefer by overpaying the check by exactly five bucks and picking up the joint in the bathroom. The front store still has lots of used books in it, Derek continued. The former owner apparently didn't take them out when he left, so they're probably worthless. We'd have to get rid of them somehow in the bookshelves. And some weirdo from the art department has been using the back room as a painting studio. But he'll have to leave. We would be the legal tenants if we rent the place. So, we would assemble in the back room, Dave asked. Is there some sort of workbench, or would we have to build one? Never mind, that's no problem. Dave was good at building things, even out of wood. How about electricity? Are there working outlets? The rental includes utilities. That is one of the charms of this deal. Personally, I think it's all going under the table to my dad's friend anyway, not the city. Everything is still connected, but we might only have a few months. The good side of that is that we can modify anything without permits, even trash the place since it's going to be torn down anyway. What about the apartment upstairs, Paul wanted to know. Not as good with money as his pragmatic older brother, the philosophy major was paying his rent by working part-time at the university bookstore, paperback section. Could I live there for nothing, he asked. It's a three-bedroom, so all of us could save money by living there, if it's decent. The building is pretty old, pre-war, Derek replied. By all of us, he meant the Anderson brothers and Dave, with possible girlfriends. Ralph was still living with his parents. We should probably incorporate if we are going to start manufacturing things, he continued authoritatively. Derek had completed a business degree and knew how to form a corporation and, more importantly, why it was a good idea. 
Ralph had already agreed to help assemble the amplifiers, using his cannibalized parts, and Paul was to be in charge of making speaker enclosures, which he thought could be made by refinishing Victor talking machine cabinets from Goodwill. In fact, the philosophy major had no experience in woodworking at all, but he had been to Europe. A factory showroom and a coffee house, Ralph said, smiling crookedly. People would come in to have coffee and hear the stereos demonstrated. You should call it the music room, then, Janie suggested, although she was mostly thinking of the bedrooms upstairs or possible poetry readings. Sure, Jane, why not, Derek said condescendingly. But we need a good name for the stereos themselves, something professional-sounding. Dad used to say you should always name a new fly-by-night company starting with United States or Federal, so it sounds substantial and legitimate right away, Paul suggested, like Federal Sound Systems. Why not fly-by-night sound systems, Ralph joked. Too obvious, Ralph, Derek snapped. But maybe FBN Sound Systems. A nice private joke that only we would be in on. We could incorporate with that name no problem. What do you think, Dave? It's your amplifier. Sure, sure, Dave replied, although he didn't care much about the name of the company. We'll need a professional silkscreen faceplate with knobs and a logo, or at least the name. I have never done anything like that. I'll look into that, Derek noted on a yellow legal pad. Probably stamped metal with holes. I'll call a few places in the yellow pages. Can you draw a picture of what needs to be on it? I can copy my Heathkit faceplate, just a different name and color, Dave proposed. Hardest knob is the function switch for tuner or turntable or auxiliary. I was thinking we could eliminate that switch altogether. No tuner or aux inputs at all. Uh, pure amplifier with automatic turntable preamp. Mrs. Mack, looking like she might cry, stood in the middle of the room in her sensible granny shoes and addressed everyone. "'We are going to clues now,' she announced sadly, "'out of respect for our martyred precedent. "'Sorry if you have no food left. "'You can move over to the cafeteria in the student union, "'but I expect that classes might be cancelled as well.' The boy entrepreneurs strode off, chattering among themselves, leaving Jane and Chris standing together, watching them cross Downer Avenue. A day that will live in infamy, Chris said, and all these idiots can think of is making money.